DHCP is an important network protocol that makes or breaks entire networks. And today we're going to discuss how it really functions in real life setup and mistakes that can cause those outages. First, we'll go through DHCP basics and what it actually is. And then we'll take a look at the Windows Server DHCP console to get a real life look at how we're using DHCP. Guys, I must mention that along with this video, I've made a lab at a new site that I've been building out, jakestechlabs.com. This lab is among a couple of other labs and it's 100% free. I really appreciate it if you check it out. Thanks so much. Let's get into it. Okay, so first things first, let's discuss what the world was like before we had DHCP. Back in the 90s and prior, when we plugged a PC into the network, we had to actually manually give it a few things. So here I have my sysadmin, Jeff. Jeff has just gotten his big, bulky new computer, and he's got to plug it into the network. Where is Jeff going to plug it into? Probably into a switch. Now, when Jeff plugs his PC into a switch, the PC automatically knows how to communicate with that switch over layer two using MAC addresses. Jeff's switch probably goes to a firewall. Jeff's firewall probably goes to the internet. Okay, if Jeff wants his computer to be able to talk to the switch, that's fine, but it really can't do much important things over layer two. It wants to be able to connect over IP, internet protocol, so it needs an IP address. Jeff manually gives his PC its IP address. Let's say he gives it 192.168.1.1. Now, if you work in IT, you know that along with an IP address, you need a subnet mask that tells your computer what network it's actually on. So Jeff gives his computer the subnet mask 255.255.255.0. Now, along with the subnet, the computer also needs to know where to send traffic when it doesn't know where to go with things. That traffic is called the default gateway. We're gonna say DGW for short. The default gateway in Jeff's case is probably the firewall. So we're gonna give it the firewall's IP. And Jeff's firewall has the IP 192.168.1.254, the last available IP in the subnet. This is very common. Now lastly, Jeff's computer now has an IP address. It knows what network it's on. It knows where to send traffic when it doesn't know where to go things. It also needs to know how to resolve domain names, how to change an FQDN into an IP address. So it needs DNS. We're gonna manually input its DNS server. Now for the DNS server, in Jeff's case, we're going to say that it's the domain controller. The domain controller has the IP 192.168.1.253. Okay, now Jeff's PC is ready to connect to the internet. Now I want you to see, this is a lot of stuff that you have to manually put into. Back in the day, Jeff would have to manually remember which PC has which IP, or at least go and check it, and ensure that he's giving out IPs that he hasn't already given out to other IPs. You can see where this would become really a ton of work if you had a lot of devices on your network, a lot of PCs, a lot of printers, and things like that. So we have this protocol that solves the issue. The protocol is DHCP. Now DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And is it super important that you remember that acronym? No, I just remembered it because I had to learn it for a bunch of different tests. What DHCP does is it dynamically gives out IPs, subnet masks, default gateway, and DNS for devices on its network. That way when guys like Jeff plug in their PCs, it automatically sends out a broadcast saying, I need an IP and this server can give it up, the DHCP server. So let's talk about a couple of those things. First, starting with your DHCP server. Understand that the DHCP server on a network can be a switch, a router, a firewall, uh, a VCE maybe, or it can be on a domain controller. So what we're going to look at today is DHCP on the domain controller. All of those different things can do the same function of a DHCP server, giving out those IP addresses. Now again, what is my DHCP server going to give out? IP, subnet mask, default gateway, and then DNS server. Now our DHCP server also has something called a scope. Let's say that I have the following network. 192.168.1.0 slash 24. This is where you're going to see subnetting and being able to manipulate IP address ranges and understand what the first and last available host is, is super important. My first available host for this subnet is going to be dot one. And then my last available host is going to be dot 254. This is because dot zero is the network address, dot 255 is the broadcast address, so I can't actually give those out. For my DHCP scope, I have a choice. I could set it up so that the server gives out all of these IP addresses from dot one to dot 254. But maybe I don't actually want to do that. Maybe I just want DHCP giving out a certain number of IP addresses, and then I have open space at the end of the scope, after the scope, that I can use to give out manually. So maybe I'll say I want my DHCP scope to just give out 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.150. So I just want those 50 or 49 or whatever IPs that it would be giving out. This way I have dot zero to dot 100 that I can allocate myself and I have dot 151 to dot 254 that I can allocate myself. This is a very common thing that you'll see in practice. Okay, we have a couple more important things that I want you to see before we actually get into the nitty gritty. And first is the DORA process. 
DORA is how DHCP actually works, and it stands for the following. D, discover. And this is your PC saying, help, I need an IP. This is what happens when you first plug it into the network. The PC will usually send this out as a broadcast, and the message will be received by the first thing in line, which is probably the switch. The switch will have something set up on it that's called an IP relay. Or if the switch is the DHCP server, it'll just respond itself. But it may relay this discover message off to the actual DHCP server. For example's sake, let's say that our switch itself is the DHCP server. So the switch receives the discover message, and it says, hey, this guy needs an uh, IP. What does the switch do? It first looks within its scope and says, hey, do I have an available IP within dot .100 to dot .150? Let's say that it does. In the case that it does, the switch will respond back with its offer. Its offer is it saying, here, do you want this one? In this case, it says, hey, want dot .107? The PC will receive this offer and it'll say a request. Yes, please, I want that one. If you work in IT and you look at some of these protocols, a lot of them have at the end an acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is usually abbreviated as ACK, and the ACK is saying, okay, this is official. Switch replies back, sounds good, this has been acknowledged. Now you may think, Jake, this is really abstract, I'm actually going to use this on the job. There will be a time when you actually need to know the DORA process for DHCP to troubleshoot issues. I've seen it multiple times where we've had devices that wouldn't get IPs through DHCP, maybe there was a relay in there where the switch was sending traffic off somewhere else, and something was blocked blocking traffic somewhere along the line. So for example, we set up Wireshark on a server and Wireshark was showing that the discover messages were coming in, the offer messages were going out, but the request was never coming back. This helped us ultimately find the issue. That was a four to eight hour troubleshooting journey I went on and the issue was that certain switches were blocking DHCP requests. Now this was by design, but the only reason that we were able to figure this out is because we understood this discover offer request ACK process. Okay, now there's one other thing that I wanna discuss before we go into the DHCP console, and that is leases. DHCP IP addresses are leased out to PCs for a certain amount of time. The standard amount of time that an IP is leased out for Windows Server is eight days. That means that if you plug a PC into the network, it should have its IP address for eight days. Now you may think that it would keep that IP address for the entire eight days. However, there is a refresh window that is generally one half of that time. So in our case, it would be four days where that PC is supposed to say, hey, I'm still here, I still want this IP, and then the DHCP server will reset that eight day lease. It's kind of weird, but it's always half of what you set it for. If after four days, the PC is not still there, the DHCP server will wipe that lease away and that IP address will be available to give out to another PC once again. Now, there are some situations where you would want a device to have an IP address within that DHCP range, but for it always to have that same IP address. In that case, you will use something called a reservation. Now what a reservation does is it maps a MAC address to an IP address. So for example, my reservation might look something like the following. I always want device with MAC address AAAABBBBCCCC to have IP address 192.168.1.108. And this is something that'll be common if we have like a PC that we want to have the same IP address because you do some specialized function on that PC or a printer, for example, or maybe a server. There is an enduring debate about whether printers should have DHCP reservations or whether they should have static IPs that you manually set for them. From my perspective, I think that everything should be put into DHCP because it's easily trackable. If you give out static IPs, you may accidentally give out a static IP within the range or an undocumented static IP, and then DHCP DHCP gives out that IP and you have what's called an IP conflict. On a subnet, this can be really messy. Also, if you're ever planning to move your subnet, make it bigger or expand your DHCP scope or anything like that, it's nice to have everything well documented. I prefer to have it in the DHCP console. Let's go to the actual console. Now again, there's a lab that accompanies this video that you can check out on jakestechlabs.com. It's the DHCP one and it'll go through actually getting this spun up on a Windows Server virtual machine in Azure. I think it'll be really useful for you to follow along. And this console is something that you're actually gonna use from time to time. And uh, it's really useful to be able to follow along and look at all of the things that we just discovered. So. What we did is we just downloaded the DHCP server console function for Windows Server, and we can just find it by typing in DHCP. Okay, so looking in the DHCP console itself, which is where we can set this up in Windows Server, I can click on IPv4. I'm almost never gonna use IPv6. And I can click on Server Options. And I can right click on Server Options and click Configure Options. So with my options, I can set the things that we were just talking about. I can set things like our router, which is gonna be our default gateway. Let's say that our router was 192.168.1.254. Now again, let's say that our DNS server was the DC, which was 192.168. 
0.253 in our example. And you can see I can set a bunch of other options as well. I can set up time servers, I can set up name servers, log servers, uh, cookie servers, LPR servers, a bunch of different things, but those are gonna be the main ones is router and DNS server. I guess one other important one is gonna be our DNS domain name. If we wanted to set that up, that'll be like something that will append to the end of devices. For our case, I'm just gonna put lab.com. Now those are my general server options, but understand I still haven't set up a scope. Let's go ahead and right click on the IPv4 server itself and we're gonna click new scope. Now here we have this nice little GUI that we can set up a new scope and let's say that this is for our Houston branch. We can give it a description, Houston PCs, next. Now here's where I can actually set up what start and end IP address I want. So we said that we wanted to start from 192.168.1.100 to 192.168.1.150. And here I set up that subnet mask. That Again, that's gonna be a CIDR slash 24. I can click next. I could set up exclusions if I want. So I could say, hey, I don't want the server to give out this IP address. If for example, I already have it statically set somewhere else, that's pretty useful. We're not gonna put any in. We'll go ahead and click next. And here I can set up that least duration that we were talking about. Right now I have it set for eight days and we'll just keep that as standard. Click next. And then it'll finally say, you have, the, have to configure the most common DHCP options before a client can use this scope. And we already have that set up. Default gateway, DNS, WINS. So I'm just gonna put, I'll configure these later and we'll go ahead and click next and then we'll finish. So here I have my scope set up for the Houston branch. It's 192.168.1.0 is the subnet. But if I look, I can double click on it and I can check things like address pool. Address pool shows me where that scope goes from. It goes from dot 100 to dot 150. Now, if I had devices plugged into my network, I would see things like address leases in this address leases thing. It would show our client IP, the name, the lease expiration, and it kind of just matches up where it has this unique ID MAC address to that IP address. So this is really useful too. You can use it to track down devices on your network. Work. If I wanted to make a reservation, I can click on reservations. I can right click it and click new reservation. Again, this is where I can set up for a certain device to have the same IP all of the time. So let's just say I want Jake's PC to always have 192.168.1.125. MAC address is going to be AAAA, BBBB, CCCC. And then for supported types, I'm always putting DHCP. And for a description, I'm going to put Jake's PC, very important. And I'll go ahead and click add. Now it's gonna give me a warning that this unique identifier may not be correct because uh, that's not a real MAC address. That's totally fine. I'm gonna use it anyway, and I will click yes, and I'll close out. And now I can see that Jake's PC is always set up to have that same IP, 192.168.1.125. If I right click on it and click properties, I can see where the MAC address is actually set up. And it looks like I was putting dots in there. That's why I said it wasn't configured correctly. Okay, go ahead and click okay. Right click on it, properties, and I can see that I have it set up. So that's a reservation for Jake's PC to always get the same thing. Note, scope options are already in there because we set them up. Router is a default gateway, DNS servers, and our DNS domain name. So guys, this has been the nitty gritty of the real DHCP server console that we're using in real environments. Again, this is just Windows Server. You can see different types of DHCP servers on routers and switches. However, this is the one of the ones that I'm seeing the most common, and it's also the easiest because you have a GUI that you can actually look at. Now, I highly advise that you do check out that lab and spin up your own server so that you can practice with the DHCP server console. You can do things like make DHCP reservations, setting up those scope options, looking into other scope options, setting up multiple different scopes within different subnets. Maybe you have a slash 24 that's the most common. Maybe you have a slash 16, a slash 20. It would be advisable for you to set up multiple different scopes using different parameters, testing out your ability to subnet and use that first host, last host, where you're gonna set up your DHCP server, how many addresses you're gonna have after the scope, and things like this. These are all real world scenarios where you're seeing commonly all the time as an IT worker. Guys, I hope this video and lab have been useful to you. I wish you all of the luck setting up your DHCP servers. Be safe, be smart, make some good decisions, and we will see you in the next one. Bye.